Oh, yeah. My name is Dan Redfield, and my fiance, Kristen, and I, we live in Anchorage, Alaska. Kristen and I kind of built our relationship on going outside and adventuring. Being a full-time filmmaker, I always have my camera with me. From day one, taking a pregnancy time lapse of Kristen, I've just kind of documented things all along the way. Having that documentation has been really important to Kristen and I, because we can look back on a lot of those memories. Ava came into the picture May 16, 2017. She came out four pounds, 15 ounces. Kind of right from the beginning, you know, we kind of had a scare. Her weight was down, her immune system was down. Within six months, Ava was as wide as she was tall, so <laughs> she caught up super quick. The odds were a little stacked against her. It wasn't until about her one year checkup when we went in to go see our doctor and being first time parents, we didn't really know what to expect, you know, where those milestones are supposed to be. I remember the doctor, he said, uh, he said, don't be alarmed, but I'm very concerned. Which at the time I was like, that's all you got? Like, you don't have a, like a diagnosis or anything? You're just gonna scare us and, <laughs> and not tell us anything? You just be very concerned, this is alarming. When, um, when we got the results back from the optometrist, I remember he came into the room and uh, when he opened the door and before he could turn around and close it, like I just saw his eyes and they were red and you could tell he'd been crying. And it was like right there, I just knew. I just knew it wasn't good. But it's like, you know, doctors have to give bad news to people all the time. But the fact that this, you know, really truly upset him um, it just kind of speaks to the compassion that he had for us and for Ava. Grief really starts at that point when you get the, the diagnosis. It doesn't start after they die. It really starts then. for a father to not be able to do anything for your child is, I mean, that's the definition of, of hopelessness is to just have to sit back and watch um, and not be able to do anything. So Ava has Tay-Sachs, which is a genetic neurological disease. She's basically not creating a certain enzyme that's used to kind of clear out toxins. And those toxins build up, and as they build up, they begin to shut down certain systems. So today she doesn't really have much eyesight, and she doesn't have very many voluntary movements. Children with Tay-Sachs, with infantile Tay-Sachs, typically have a lifespan of between three and five years. You know, as long as she's here, I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna try to stay positive as much as we can. 
There's no point in mourning her when she's still here. One of the palliative care people, the way that she framed it was, are you extending a good life or are you prolonging a bad one? So we want to focus on prolonging a life as long as it's good and happy and comfortable. But if it ever gets to the point where she's in pain or she's not you know, happy and we're only keeping her around for us, um, you know, then it's, it's not worth it. Her comfort and her happiness, it comes first. It's one of those things where um, unless you've gone through something like this, it's, it's hard to imagine. You can't fight the disease. Um, so you fight every day for comfort to try and enjoy the, the little happy moments that you have. The best parts of our day or of our week is when we have those little moments where Ava giggles and she smiles and we can see that happiness from her. Um, that's hope for us. Because with something like this, especially a rare disease, you feel like you're the only one. You feel targeted. You feel like this is happening to you and just you. There's so much more when you have a child with an incurable condition. The doctors can provide you with a lot of medical care and support. Uh, but there is so much more support that the family needs, and it encompasses their whole life. Because she can't see, exciting her other senses are really important. So whether it's like sun on her face, wind in her hair, or the sounds of the beach, those are important things to her and they're things that make her happy because now we can spend the entire summer going out and camping and, and making those memories that are really important to us. Adventure for Ava was created under the idea that our best memories that we've created as a family were those made outside. A lot of special needs families don't have the opportunity to go outside. So our second family is a family of 12 with four special needs kids, and they have two dogs, so they're a dog-loving family. Their son Kai is nine years old, and he has a spinal cord issue, which basically limits the amount of movement that he has with his legs. So for these adventures, I want to figure out what the kids with special needs can't do on their own and see if we can help facilitate that. So when I approach them with an idea of like, hey, with these considerations, what if I could get you guys together with a dog musher, get to see the dogs, get to go on a dog sled ride. Kai, when I met him, was a very shy and kind of timid boy. But boy, when he got on that sled and he had the dogs bark in and jump in and the people alongside the road cheering, dude, he had the full blown like Queen of England wave, man. He was just like from ear to ear. This kid was so happy. And Ava also rode with Wade Mars a couple of years before. And I knew how important that was for Kristen and Ava. So to be able to help facilitate that for another family, but that was really important. And then to be able to take what I've learned over the past 10 years being a filmmaker and package it in a way that they can watch their video and, and be able to get those memories and those, those sights and those smells and all those emotions kind of coming back. They were able to make memories outside that maybe they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. I think the through line with Ava's story is perseverance. You know, she's a strong little girl. It's something that can easily break somebody. Parents rarely leave the bedside. So this puts a strain not only on them financially, many of the parents will lose their job or have to quit their job because the demands that it takes to take care of their child and their other children and their family is overwhelming for them. The lives of these children are so short. There's a lot of pain, there's a lot of suffering for not only the child, but the family. 
You could turn to self-medication. You could turn to, you know, hurting yourself, hurting others. Um, it's just a very difficult thing to go through. I know for Kristen and I, it kind of feels like you're trapped on an island. You're, you're, you're just isolated. And when something like this happens to you, you feel very alone. You want to spread awareness about a different way of caring for people. It doesn't have to be you just go in the hospital and you stay there. I guess we want to encourage people to step out and look at different challenges in their life and other people's lives and step into that and not be afraid to do that.